Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 115 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am Pravez Ahmed, and I am joined, as always, by Omar Ansari. Hey, assalamu alaikum, everybody. Assalamu alaikum, Pravez. It's good to finally be back. We've been, we've been gone for a while. Summer came and went. We have. Summer came and went. I don't know where summer went, but uh, I do want to call attention to the hiatus, and we apologize to our dear and beloved listeners that we've been gone for as long as we have. Um, just craziness i don't know it's like I, we don't really have a i mean life took over that's that's yeah. probably the best we can describe it um life well, you took know, over sorry yeah you know what happened is we had a year and a half well, not a year and a half maybe a year and a couple months of not yeah. having to take the kids anywhere <laughs> yeah yeah no you're <laughs> and then, right and basically come come into may after after my older one got vaccinated i said you know what i'm gonna try to make this summer fun for them Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I kind of went over above, over and, 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 you know, above and beyond that you did say. my friend. Yeah. Uh, to, my can't... kids were like, Hey, why can't we be more like, you know, our cousins? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. So we did, we did Disneyland and Universal and great America and pool every weekend and movies and yeah. lots, lots of fun stuff. So, um, uh, but now School is back, and I'm very happy because we're back in on fact, a routine. In fact, you were such a good – you you, you remember, uh, and our listeners will remember this, was it the Two Gods episode where you had to – where you lit left because you had dad duties? Maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, it was. <laughs> it, it was Two Gods, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. It's coming back to me. Uh, of course, we also had – Which was our to, – to catch our listeners up was our last could have sort of technical episode, uh, although the last time they probably heard from us was – when we spoke about um, uh, Austin Pine, we'll definitely get into that as well. But um, yeah, di- yeah, di- same here, Omar. I mean, like we, we did a little bit of traveling, uh, although no, nowhere near as much as you guys. Um, although, um, you know, we, we, we went to Chicago for a little bit. We we're in Houston for a little bit, uh, which were great. But I still feel like the summer was so protracted. Like it was just a really short summer. And now here we are, both of our, well, both of our sets of daughters are back in school. Um, I am actually the father of a college, uh, a, a, a college <laughs> freshman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Right. College, yeah, college freshman. And I got a high schooler. I got a high schooler. So we're both we're both uh, heading oh, yeah. to milestone. Wait, so this is her first year in high school? Yep, yep, yeah. Wow, dude, yeah, can you crazy. believe it? No, yeah. it's it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So, but I'm glad they're back. They're they're super excited. Um, Good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and well, so for your kids had gone back at least temporarily. Well, not your ninth grader, but your but 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 the little one had gone back in person, right? Very briefly. Uh, I think it was like very four briefly. or five weeks. Yeah. That's right. That's right. My daughters, on the other hand, never went back to school. So basically, uh, after we went into lockdown March 2020, we have not been back to school up until now. Uh, mm-hmm. up until August. And as our listeners may know or remember, uh, not only I've got my kids in school, my wife is a school teacher. So everyone's technically back in school, but, uh, you know, you know, alhamdulillah, like, you know, uh, by God's grace, everybody's vaccinated. Everybody's trying to stay healthy. Obviously now we've got this Delta variant and so on going on. And, you know, we just hope everybody out there is, you know, taking the, the right precautions and, you know, doing what they need to do. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's scary, man. It's going to be up and down. We'll see how this thing goes. Um, but I do, Omar, uh, want to go back to something we touched on, and I, I'm sure our listeners would like to hear because they've probably seen not only or heard from our um, request on the last episode, but also uh, a lot of online. Uh, there's been a lot of online uh, talk and discussion and, and posts, sorry, and, and people talking about Asim Pai, your brother-in-law, you know, I guess – my cousin's husband, mm-hmm. your sister's husband. So uh, maybe we can just catch up our listeners on a kind of a high level where, where things are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've learned a lot. Uh, the family's learned a lot. Uh, he, so he's doing okay. I mean, he's had, he's had uh, several rounds of chemo, uh, which basically wipes out your, 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 you know, your, your immune system really. Um, of course, um, in parallel, we've been trying to find a match for his stem cell transplant uh, there's not, a, I think we talked about last time, there's not a lot of 
folks in the Asian community who have registered to be a match. So we've had se- several drives in partnership with uh, a couple of nonprofits that really try to get folks to, to register and in- increase the number of Asians in the National Registry, specifically the Asian American Donor Program. They've been amazing. Um, we've gone to mosques, but we've also gone to temples and gurdwaras. Um, uh, festivals, easy. festivals, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, so, it's, it's been, um, of course, the, they did. You know, we had volunteers. I, I went to a couple in the beginning, and then you know, I had to balance it with family life. But uh, we had a lot of volunteers. Shout out to all the folks who who, who stepped up. Some, to be honest, some people I, we don't even don't don't even know. Awesome, but there was one um, Berkeley student. She she basically just reached out uh, on Facebook and said, "Can I help?" And she's been like yeah. a superstar. Um, other, others, you know, family, friends have been helping, but, uh, still no match, unfortunately, still no, no 10 out of 10 match. Uh, so we're still doing a last ditch effort. And if that doesn't work, um, I think, you know, resort to a, a partial match, a family member who's a, a, not a perfect match, but, you know, given the experience that the doctors have these days, uh, they're going to try to make it work. So that's, that's going to probably happen in, in sometime in late September. Um, because there, you know, there's not, you don't have unlimited amount of time because if you wait, then the, uh, cancerous cells that got wiped out with the chemo could, could come back. I mean, the analogy that the doctors have used that I thought resonated was think of it like a, uh, a field with a whole bunch of weeds growing that don't, shouldn't be there. Right. So what you do is you basically get rid of all the weeds and plow, plow everything, get rid of the grass, get the weeds. At some point, those weeds could come back. So you need to plant the flowers, um, before the weeds start coming back, right? So that's kind of the analogy. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I mean, prayers are uh, welcome yes. uh, and uh, more than welcome. You know, we ask for your prayers, but uh, still never too late to register to be a match. Uh, you can do so at be the uh, If you're 18 to 44, if you don't help, help Austin by, you'll help uh, potentially somebody uh, down the road. It's, it's a pretty relative, you know, it's a pretty straightforward process to, to be a, a, a donor. Um, the thing is though, you know, it's not, it's not easy to find a match. Only one out of 400 people who register even get a call back. Um, so we just need people in volume to, to register and, and, and Charlie help some, you'll help end up helping somebody out. Helping somebody. Yeah, exactly. And paying it forward as it were. Um, yeah, I mean, grossly underrepresented. We talked about this in the registry in the national registry, um, the Indian Pakistani people from the subcontinent. So are Mm -hmm. grossly underrepresented. So if you're 18 to 44, it's, it's, you know, you could, with no euphemism, you could literally give the gift, the gift of life to someone, which is a completely harmless and, and painless procedure for you as the donor. Mm-hmm. But uh, you would literally be giving someone the gift of life. So please, uh, if you haven't registered, um, become part of the registry. But yeah, fr- I mean, the outpouring of love, the outpouring of support. And frankly, I mean, just the amazing work that these nonprofits, uh, I've seen it, Omar, just being with you and being involved in, in just, I mean, I'm not nowhere near as involved as you are, but nonetheless, just keeping abreast of uh, like these various organizations and all the drives and whatnot that they're doing. It's been amazing. It it really is. And they do this year in and year out. So it's not even like, you know, and so, um, yeah, it's, 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 frankly, it's amazing. So, uh, but, but yeah, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I'll just say one thing is uh, obviously, you know, Austin Pie's um, here. And uh, one thing I will say, not not a single complaint. Uh, yeah. You know, Austin, by but he has he has not complained once, even though it's you know not a, obviously a very uh, uncomfortable to say the least process. So, uh, kudos to him, mashallah. So, absolutely, always smiling. Uh, you ask him how he's doing, and he's like, uh, you know, Allah's fadl. You know, that's what he literally says. So, um, yeah, just uh, just an amazing person. So, um, you know, um, like you like you said, and I want to sort of reinforce. Um, or repeat, like, you know, obviously where prayers of well-being and afia and health, uh, please uh, do remember him in your prayers and, and do that. But also, like I said, uh, in terms of sort of um, stuff you can do um, on the ground uh, is you can help spread the word about the registry and become part of the registry as well. So yeah. and, uh, and please go ahead and do that. And we'll, and we'll continue to update you inshallah, yeah. as things progress. And I don't know if we actually specifically said it in this recording. We obviously, we had a short recording uh, about this, uh, yeah. our last post, but it's, it's AML leukemia. Um, that's, that's the, the specific diagnosis. That's right. That's right. So, 
Uh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I guess transitioning from that, I mean, it's, it's a weighty and, and kind of heavy subject, uh, to something that isn't, uh, any less weightier, I'm afraid, or any less heavy. And that is, uh, of course, what's going on in the news and so on. We, we, we talked about Delta, but you uh, moving even beyond past coronavirus, obviously internationally what's happening. I mean, we had the massive sort of withdrawal from Afghanistan, which, uh, turned into a complete, uh, I mean, like, obviously, everyone knew it was coming. Um, Human- humanitarian that, disasters. Yeah, is but I'm saying, like, yeah. this was something that, you know, long time in the making, long time awaited by a lot. Um, I think people on the left and right, um, you know, um, it was something that I think conversations had begun during the last administration. But, you know, Biden went ahead and pulled the plug, as it were. And, uh, yeah, we had a, you know, we're in the midst of a massive humanitarian crisis. Uh, and of course, the Taliban, like, and the fall of the government uh, in a matter of days, and then the takeover of the government by the Taliban. Um, and so we are obviously watching those events very closely unfolding. And uh, we thought we would do our part, which is to try and have a conversation with someone who knows a little bit something and knows a lot more something than we, you and I do. And, and in fact, has been, uh, was on the ground uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, working with some of the efforts of the former government to institution, institution, yeah, institutionalize the constitution and ratify and so on. So um, anyway, without a lot of further ado, I want to introduce our guest for the show. And that is that we are delighted to be joined by Hamid Murad Khan. Um, Hamid is an adjunct professor of Islamic law at the University of Michigan. He's a national security fellow with the Truman National Security Project. And he is also is an attorney and has worked extensively uh, both in the private sector as well as in the, um, in the government space as well. Prior to, um, uh, or in addition to his sort of academic credentials, he presently serves as judicial education attorney at the Federal Judicial Center. And in the past, he has worked for the United States Institute of Peace, where, in, uh, and it was that it was during that stint where he actually spent time in Afghanistan, uh, working, uh, as I said, literally in Kabul uh, on the ground. Uh, trying to set up and establish that government. So uh, someone who's intimately involved with what's been happening in Afghanistan, and in fact, his family hails from there. Um, JD from the University of Michigan Law School and undergrad bachelor's in political science with honors and distinction from the University of Wyoming. Yeah, so welcome to the show, Hamid. Uh, Thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. We're really excited about today's conversation. So, um, but um, as we often like to do, um, I know that uh, although we, 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 we certainly intended to have you come and speak about the uh, present situation in Afghanistan as it's unfolding and, and certainly give us kind of an analysis of what got us here, um, and really would love your thoughts on that. But I think uh, as we often like to do, and just so that our guests can kind of get, situ- I'm sorry, our listeners can get situated with our guests, uh, we'd love to kind of dive a little bit into your background um, little, you know, learn a little bit more about yourself. So as we like to ask, uh, what's kind of your origin story? And, and, well, and just adding to that, um, tell us, you know, start with your parents coming to this country. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I talking to you offline, uh, you, you teased a little that you grew up in Wyoming. I'd love to hear about that. Cause I'm a Pacific Northwester as, as well, uh, growing up and there weren't a lot of, uh, Muslims growing up. So I'd love to hear about that experience. So yeah, do, do tell us, uh, starting with, you know, how your parents came to this country. Well, first off, let me thank you for having me. It's quite an honor to to be included with such a lineup. Uh, my origin really begins uh, probably one of the more humble places in America, which is rural Wyoming. Um, and it's not often that you hear a lot of Muslims living there, but actually my father uh, specifically emigrated to the United States in 1966 and my mother in 1972, or if I'm correct, 1972 or 1974. Um, and they followed on the, on the heels of some earlier members of my family, the Khan family, who came to Wyoming uh, through the auspices of one Zarif Khan, uh, a.k.a. Louis Hatamali Khan, who uh, began his sojourn in America by landing in a place like New York uh, and deciding he didn't like New York and he kept moving west. 
he hit California. He didn't like California, so he moved east, and he landed in all places in a place known as Sheridan, Wyoming. And it was there that he uh, sold tamales and later hamburgers. Uh, he gained notoriety, but his notoriety wasn't just because he made a mean burger, which we sort of think might be related to the chaplia kebab of our of our family, but also because he was a generous soul and he uh, he had an impact on the family. Today, uh, my uncle's uh, statue has been erected in his honor for having such an impact on the community. So that was that was sort of the the humble beginnings, and, and then I I uh, sort of took off from that from that vantage point of of living in Wyoming and living in the midst of uh, a very rural community and and being Muslim at the same time. That, that's amazing. Did you have a bit of a clan? Like, was there a Han clan uh, in in? Did you say Sheridan? Was there a clan? Well, I guess if you could consider the clan my family, that would be it. Um, my father, my father was uh, he came when my uncle passed away, and he helped his sister, my aunt, uh, with her business affairs and in the raising of her family. And he then uh, uh, started his own. Uh, work as a grocery bag boy. And then later he would enter into the hospitality business. And since then, uh, members of my family have been coming since. Many of them have settled in Wyoming, but also out West. And uh, my father uh, now has uh, more than a dozen hotels in several Western states. Uh, And the reach of my family has extended throughout the Western United States with dozens of hotels, but I'm, I'm not in the hotel business for disclosure purposes. Hospitality of another kind, I'm sure. Um, That's right. You know, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) No, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, uh, I'd love to, so kind of maybe even go back a little further because I think this is probably going to inform perhaps some of our conversation later is um, where do your family roots you know, hail from in terms of the subcontinent or, you know, a, you know, Asia in general, perhaps? Well, uh, my mother and my father are both ethnic Pashtuns, uh, and we uh, grew up, or they grew up rather, uh, on the on the western side uh, of that line, or rather the eastern side of that line in Pakistan, uh, living in what we call the Chuch area, of Pakistan, so near the Indus River Valley, and uh, but our origins are of the Alazai Pashtun tribe that traces its roots back to Kandahar. So, if you want to go even further back, uh, you know we're sort of lost to the mystery of that of that area of, of Northwest Asia. Do you know in your family's history, like when they sort of, um, I guess, immigrated into Pakistan or present day Pakistan? Like was really it, is it a few generations above, like before you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's hard, okay. It's it's hard to trace those origins because, of course, the line that the British drew to separate the Pashtuns is sort of an arbitrary line and remains a dispute to this day. So it's hard. Wait, to Wait, wait. So the British drew arbitrary lines in the sand and created countries and boundaries. Wait, <laughs> come on. I mean, that doesn't and happen. Divided- and divided peoples. Imagine that. Wait, come on. You're blowing our mind here. No. So, so okay. real so. quick, bef- before, I, we, we, you know, we definitely want to move on to the, to the top. I have to, I have to say this. Did you say Ali Zay? Ali Zay? Yeah, Ali Zay. Yeah. Okay. Ali Zay. I don't know if that's the same thing, but my, my kids are one fourth uh, Ali Zay. So, uh, well, but we can talk that about that be. online. <laughs> right. Maybe. There yeah. you go. Right, because on their like like uh, maternal side, right, Omar? It's That's like right. what Pakistan, like a certain part of Pakistan, I guess, uh, Aptabad, that area. No, no, on on, on uh, my their nana's side, it's the Alize from Dera Ismail Khan. Which ah, is, yeah, yeah. Okay, but, wow, fascinating. Yeah, yeah I was thinking about go. that because I was, yeah, because when, yeah, when Hamid was talking, um, yeah. So, and then to your point about being from Wyoming, um, I, I imagine you and Omar could talk for hours about just growing up in kind of a small Muslim community, rural America, what have you. And although Umar, I mean, Spokane, to be fair, is not rural America, but 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 certainly, you know, I, I'm from Houston, Texas. So for me, it's a completely different ballpark to some of y'all's experiences. Um, but, but, but Hamid, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for uh, a, a mutual friend of ours and a avid listener of the show. And, uh, and so special shout out to Tariq Hafiz, 
who I oh. understand is your classmate from law school. That's right. He he and I are longstanding classmates uh, at Michigan Law School. Yeah. So this is one of those crazy. Well, it's not crazy story, but just the way it, it's 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 so emblematic of the kind of modern world we live in. So uh, I mean, I, I apologize. You, I, you weren't on my radar until I think uh, it was actually Tharik made a comment on a post of yours on Facebook and said, hey, you know, I think he was asking for your thoughts on what's happening right now in Afghanistan. And we had been looking for someone who could speak intelligibly and, and could offer a kind of a perspective about what is happening. And I was like, OK, this cannot be just coincidence. I mean, Tharik makes this comment. I trust Tharik's uh, judgment um, about people, and 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 Darik is a dear friend as well. Um, so just so you know, I, I I spent about three years of my life in in Michigan, probably around the same time. I mean, you know, not not around the same time you did, but I think I missed you. Um, you were a few years prior to me, um, but uh, yeah. So um, that's how I got to know Darik, and voila, here we are. But uh, just wanted to give a special shout out to that. That's great. That's good to hear. Yeah. In fact, I just had lunch with him last week. He was visiting, dropping his daughter off to college out here, his oldest daughter. And uh, so we got to grab lunch together. And that's, we, we talked more about, yeah, how he knows you and things like that. Well, I, I'm indebted to Tarek. He helped me out. He's he's always been a dear and consistent friend, but he's also, uh, he helped me out uh, a little while back when I was in a pinch. So I'm eternally grateful, uh, not only for how he's helped me, but his friendship as well. Yeah, he, he's, he's a great guy. Uh, and, and he does listen. So, I, I you know, you're, uh, yeah, he will get that uh, bit of uh, gratitude. So um, I, I guess, I mean, uh, uh, kind of as we dive further in into your own background, so you did you, you do your undergrad at the University of Wyoming in political science. Um, and then was it law school right away? What What sort of brought your career in that direction or professionally in that direction? Well, it actually took uh, took a uh, an extra year, um, and that year was to spend time uh, cultivating a little bit more worldly experience. Uh, but in terms of the ultimate aim of law school, it's sort of uh, where I am now, which is uh, the aim of law school wasn't to become a partner at a big firm, for which is the aspiration of many. Uh, it was actually to pursue a career in public service, uh, and. Uh, as you can just imagine from the prelude I just gave you about a family being in the hospitality business and, and being the son of immigrants that, uh, you know, that kind of rubs against the grain of being rich and wealthy and, 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 and uh, you know, following the aspirations of many immigrant families in Asia who say, well, why do anything else? But, uh, you know, uh, you know, make, uh, make a good, a good living. And uh, so, yeah my aim was was law school and to be idealistic and make a difference wow um enjoyed law school i, I imagine just from a j j just your experiences there i mean obviously university of michigan outstanding school that, that m must have been a great experience in general loved law school um yeah. in awe of my classmates and still am excellent excellent uh so i think then after that you clerk for a bit um you practice, I think, for a few years, you know, you're, you're, you're you are, you know, uh, so it wasn't like public service or public health or, or excuse me. Yeah. Public service right away. But I think you, you did a few years uh, practicing. What then kind of connects you into, I think, some of the work that you get involved with uh, later on? What, 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 I mean, obviously, like you mentioned, that was certainly the intent. Um, but I'd love to kind of have have you navigate how, you know, how you made that journey. Well, first and foremost, it was always my aspiration, and it's mm -hmm. what drove me to uh, clerk for a judge, a uh, federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, and then uh, briefly for the U.S. Attorney's Office. And all the while, while my resume is replete with uh, references to uh, some very re well-respected firms, uh, I always had the itch to be in public service. And mm -hmm. you know, after after my twin daughters were born, uh, I'm the proud father of four, but after the, my twin daughters were born, I sort of had an epiphany where I began to realize that my place in life, while great and frankly established, was largely at the behest of working at the firm, spending a multitude of hours, and having this moment where I sort of realized that 
I could only serve the interests of clients who who uh, could afford to pay me, and they were corporations. Now, I, I, I say this also with the caveat that I, I've had the experience during the time I was in private practice to do some extraordinary things, like working as counsel of record for six detainees at Guantanamo Bay, uh, mm-hmm. for working um, you know, on some public service work. But I think the real transformative transformation happened to me when I realized that um, the the situation in Afghanistan, the situation in Iraq, the fact that we were constantly bombarded with the discussion about Muslims, both in America and abroad, and what that meant. And I think that that is what finally drove me to sort of say I was fed up with the run-of-the-mill practice that um, I had become accustomed to. And that brings you to the um, uh, USIP, right? The United States Institute of Peace. Um, love for you to talk or, 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 or tell our listeners kind of what that is about, uh, like what the organization, what the institute is about, and obviously your work there. I know you you, you do sort of two different roles, uh, one that is here stateside and one actually that actually, you know, ha- has you on the ground as it were in Afghanistan. Well, uh, first off, I should I should emphasize that uh, before I joined USIP, um, my my first uh, entry into this field was on behalf of Stanford Law School. Uh, Stanford was being funded by the State Department to um, stand up a legal studies program at the American University in Kabul, and I became their first full time postdoctoral fellow. So my job was to uh, help edit their textbooks to bring to bear some of my understanding of Islamic law, which I was um, teaching at the time at the University of Colorado and previously at the University of Wyoming. And from there, I spent time in country helping to develop a program, interacting with students. And it got it also got me in front of people like General Stanley McChrystal, uh, who at the time was presiding over and, and, and running the show on the, mm-hmm. on the behalf of the coalition. Wow. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Omar, you go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I asked your question. Go ahead. Perfect. Oh, I, I was just going to so, so the, um, I, I was curious though, like e- even growing up though, had you ever been back to, had you ever visited Afghanistan growing up? I'd never been to Afghanistan. You had never been to Afghanistan. Okay. Never been. Yeah. Um, I but I had been to Pakistan many times. I'd yeah. been to this area. I'd been to the area uh, near the Afghan border, and in fact, I got married there. Uh, you know, just only a few years right after my first year of law school. So, um, so there's always there's always a close affinity between you know what I grew up with, how I understood my perspective in the world as being the son of immigrants, but also seeing the world as a much smaller place that um, I think had a really important effect on me. And then of course, being a third year law student after during 9-11 brought all of that to focus. And what was perhaps the most important finding in all of that was this ongoing, but frankly, uh, narrow discourse about Muslims, Islam, and America. And that really was the pushing point to, to make me want to serve uh, in some way, shape, or form. Now, now of course, in that, in, as a student, you don't always know those things, but as time came about, I found a place. So I'd love to now kind of use this as a chance to um, talk about what you're seeing and how what you saw at that time, your experiences, what you saw, how that fed into where we are today, um, specifically, what was going on uh, and what were things going positively, negatively, all the way up to the point where now then in 2019, I believe, Trump decides, hey, uh, we need to make a deal with the, with the Taliban uh, or change course, right? And and Biden ends up right. doubling down on it. I'd love to hear about your experience and then kind of how that plays into kind of the, the, the last couple of years politically. Well, um, as was mentioned before, after my first year in Afghanistan, I went back, and this time as be, as and on behalf of a uh, U.S. government entity known as the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, specifically with the goal of building up their building up the Afghan capacity on uh, rule of law 
And specifically, I was tasked with a number of different um, issues, issues as, you know, perhaps as mundane to some on constitutional interpretation, figuring out who in Afghanistan's government really had the ultimate say of what the constitution meant. But I also had some really interesting topics that really spoke to me on a different level. And one of them was a, um, a project on what does Islam say about the thorny questions of post-conflict justice? And, you know, if you, if for the listeners, if they're thinking, well, what does post-conflict justice look like? You know, there's a variety of for- forums where this has been discussed. The Nuremberg trials uh, after World War II was perhaps the most infamous Uh, but then also South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And we were confronted, or we wanted to tackle this issue from a different perspective. What does Islam as a religion say to the question about post-conflict reconciliation? How do we talk about forgiveness? How do we talk about a society moving on? So that spoke to me in a way, on a deeper level, because what I also saw and what I also believe personally And in my experience in Afghanistan is that uh, one of the transcendental issues that affects Afghanistan's longevity, whether it be, you know, the the Taliban or the current government or, frankly, all the previous attempts to establish governance, is the way in which Islam, Islamic identity is the binding force for many of the Afghan people. It is what given them a great deal of say in their future. It's also an important value-based system for many people. And of course, we're not just limited to Afghanistan. We're also talking about, you know, 1.7 billion people, people here in the United States, people across the world. But the reason why it spoke to me, and I think um, it, it drove a lot of my work for the next five years, is because I believed, and, I, and, I, and many are also convinced of this, uh, that the real way to get at uh, Afghanistan's future was to look at values in which everybody could come to an agreement about. Everyone could could um, come to a consensus that we may not all agree on the Jeffersonian institutions of democracy. We may not agree on the style of a Supreme Court, whether it be a French Court of Cassation or an American Supreme Court, but we could agree on the principles that Islam teaches us about a variety of different things. And I think that that is what was the guiding principle of my work, uh, both in country and in the years subsequent. And, and you wrote about this um, last week, I believe, in, on a, in an article, I believe in the USAT called Taliban Doesn't Equal Islam, How new, News Coverage of Afghanistan Dis- Disserves a Great Religion. And, and my question is, between that ideal of the possibility of the of the people you know learning the greatest ideals of islam what was the what was the what was the gap between that ideal and what you were seeing on the ground in reality if any well you know it's a contest really um perhaps there is no ideal that we can all sort of wrap our hands around except for the ideal set forth by the prophet muhammad and this idea that we live under as muslims about what does the prophet's guidance tell us and what that milieu actually means. Uh, But I think that despite that, we as Muslims are constantly of the mindset that we should strive for the ideal. That's really what, what it's all about is we may not, we may fall short, but we should always strive for the ideal and intention and action. And in Afghanistan, that contest of ideas I mean, listen, we're talking about the Taliban. We're talking about people who, in their own nomenclature, in their own naming ideology, see themselves as students of the Sharia, students of Islamic law. And in fact, their brand of incorruptibility is what gave them license to use arms, to use force, and to bring about uh, what, many were, m- what many believe is a draconian view of Islamic law. In their mind, however, they believed that this was a way to establish the normative expectations of Muslims, particularly those in a war-ravaged country like Afghanistan. Now, the tragedy in all this wasn't necessarily that the Taliban, not only was it the tragedy of what the Taliban had brought in terms of their strict interpretation of Islam and Sharia, but that the government that, that came 
as a result of the U.S. invasion and the coalition forces also made claims towards Islam. Uh, and yet at the same time, the, many of the accusations uh, that occurred to previous governments came to define the current government. And that was corruption. That was self-interest. That was um, uh, wayward values. And of course, those are potent accusations to be leveled at any government. It doesn't matter whether that government is a Western government or an Islamic government, but this was particularly valuable in the hands of the Taliban. It was, it was a valuable accusation leveled at the critics of the government. And frankly, I think it's what led to uh, their abrupt uh, fall over the last couple of weeks because the perception, they were never able to shake the perception that they were corrupt, self-interested, and frankly, uh, even the actions of some of the members of their government have only served to highlight that accusation. Mm. How about like the accusation, if, you know, if it was, you know, if, if that was actually what happened uh, on the ground in terms of um, against the government about being sort of a, you know, installation of Western powers, Western interest, American interest. Was that also a, a, a potent sort of, you know, uh, ideological frame that the Taliban then use uh, more recently? I think it's, of course, uh, it, it's certainly part of, uh, it's certainly part of the framework that they wish to identify um, you know, but I but I think that the to be fair, many Western governments, particularly the United States, but many Western governments across NATO and uh, the like, were frustrated with the Afghan government. Were frustrated by the inefficiencies, the ineffectiveness, and frankly, one of the the perennial problems that President Biden identified uh, last week in his comments was that Afghanistan is a very difficult place to govern for any go- for any government, and that. Re- that wasn't, um, you know, just situated to the to the current government. Even the Taliban never had complete control of Afghanistan. The kings of the past never had control. And as we just mentioned at the outset, even the dividing line of what is the limit of Afghanistan, should it, you know, is it the Duran line? Is it the Indus River? Even that question is still not defined today in the minds of many people. Mm. So yeah, like how do you exactly govern even a territory that 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 whose borders are not clearly identified, as it were? And um, it sounds like there was clearly a lot of corruption, and whatnot, in the in the in the previous government. You know, the the U.S. supported government were the were the people pretty much at a point where they were fed up with that and wanted some change, uh, because obviously on the news you hear you hear what they're scared of. They don't want this change for, you know, they don't want Taliban, they don't want, et cetera, rights to be lost. But were they at the same time fed up and want some sort of change or was it kind of just being accepted? You know, it's funny because I think that the challenge that many governments have around the world, whether it's Afghanistan or here in America, is that we often don't really get to a point of measuring the effectiveness of our government until we are deprived of of services. And, There's always the promise that, and many of those promises came from the Afghan government, that they would deliver. And I think there was a growing frustration uh, of a disparity between the haves and the have-nots, particularly between places like Kabul and those outside of Kabul and the more rural communities. I think many in the provinces felt resentful of all the accumulated uh, wealth that Kabul was getting. And frankly, it's what drove many of the people of Afghanistan to resettle in Kabul, such that it was, you know, at last count, over 5 million people in those areas. And so I think, yes, I think that there were many um, who felt that the government was out of touch, that they felt that the government was not listening to them. Um, I don't know that it necessarily translated to, uh, you know, we want the Taliban to completely take over. But let's not forget, the Taliban have always been present. They were present in many of these provinces and places like Kandahar and Harad. They were running parallel services alongside the government. In other words, where the government was at its weakest, the Taliban were at its strongest. And I don't think there was ever a really a, a point in which, especially in the last 10 years, 
where the Taliban weren't in some way present in most areas of the country running parallel services. So this wasn't, this wasn't a sudden and emergent takeover. I think what was happening was, especially in those places, in the provinces, um, they were running parallel services, however draconian they might be to us, and the government just completely lost out. Was this like in cooperate? Were they like a like just a partner or like an organization that was tolerated? Or how, how does like if it's essentially another you know another army? How did they did they live in 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 parallel and harmony or was it how did that work? Um, I don't know if it would be a harmony is the right word. I guess the description that I often uh, hear from from Afghans is that they were shadow. Uh, they lived in the shadows, so to speak, that, for example, um, when, when many Afghans, because I worked in the rule of law space, uh, many Afghans said that if because, for example, the new government's courts or legal institutions were so far removed, they often found that local justice, i.e. Taliban justice, was more readily available to meet their needs. And remember, when we talk about this dialogue between government, governance in general, between citizen and their government, we're also talking about a social contract. And if the government was considered to be aloof or far away, then many people resorted to justice at a local level. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, this, this fits completely with what I'm talking about of Afghanistan, think about the American context. One of the reasons why the United States embraced a more... Uh, a, a concept known as federalism, in other words, dividing authority between the localities of the states and the national government, was in much the same way what was going on in Afghanistan. Many people repeatedly insisted that while they did not prefer Taliban justice, uh, they saw that as the only meaningful, legitimate justice they could achieve to resolve their disputes. And and so which do you take? Uh, would, do you take a faraway evil where you're spending an, an enormous amount of money getting your case heard, where you may have to bribe officials, where you may have to bribe police? Or do you go to the Taliban who say, well, we're adherents of Islamic law and we'll only deliver justice to you. We'll deliver it quickly. And that, that I think, appealed to a lot of Afghans, for example. Hmm. I, 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 I'm, I'm also curious, like, how... Like and, and and this may require us to go back just a little and maybe at a high level, but but you know how how did the Taliban come to enjoy even that level of sort of legitimacy? Um, because I mean I, I think if we trace the roots of the Taliban back to the Mujahideen and and the fighters against the uh, Soviet invasion in the eighties, uh, there continues to be a sort of struggle and 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 tribal conflicts that. That, that 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 resulted after that back you know after the Soviets leave um, and 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 I think for anybody who was watching following even international news and it was like just a blip in the radar before 911 but certainly becomes relevant then you know the Taliban had killed you know Ahmed Shah Massoud who my understanding was is that he was a very beloved sort of figure um, and his movement his group uh, so I guess, like, how did the Taliban kind of emerge as the sort of de facto or legitimate, um, you know, voice of local justice and, you know, um, uh, legitimacy? In one word, if you could summarize it, exhaustion. Uh, okay. You had, you had an exhausted populace that was exhausted with the Soviet era, right? And the, the Soviet, uh, the Mujahideen period culminates in the Soviet withdrawal in 1989. And you, but you then have in the interim period, no resolution as to what happens uh, with the Soviet uh, backed government in, in uh, President Najibullah, and who's still taking a place in, in Kabul, uh, until the Soviets actually, they themselves collapsed in 1992. And then from the period from 1992 to 1996, the Taliban continued to emerge. The Taliban, however, don't are in many ways uh, individuals who are uh, most of them are Afghan, but many of them are also the product of the refugees that resettled in places like Pakistan. 
and mm. they earn their education oftentimes in an ad hoc way in the madrasas in Pakistan, particularly influenced by the Diobandi strain. That Diobandiism, that strict, um, not necessarily literalism, but focused on action, less on intent, uh, meant or translated in the minds of many of those students into a call to action. And the Taliban emerge, frankly, promising an end to the squabbles, and frankly, not just squabbles, because that's to minimize the suffering, to end the warlord's grip and the constant civil war that was, that was besieging the country. So they come into the country both armed and promising uh, this, this measure of incorruptibility, i.e. the Taliban, and they put the warlords to shame. Uh, they basically try to stabilize the situation and their initial message to the Afghan people was to bring peace. That was their real first and foremost message. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the emphasis of the, of the Taliban from 1992 to 1996, they, they don't come in with a statecraft. They don't come in with the ambitions of say other Islamist organizations like going on in the Middle East and going on in the 20th century, they're trying to reframe the Islamic and Islamic state and modernity. What they are saying is we're just tired and we're willing to back, uh, back ourselves with force to bring peace to the country. By 1996, when they achieve their aspirations of taking over Kabul, they are thrust into this position now where they're describing themselves as an emirate. But remember, as you rightly point out, Ahmed Shah Massoud, uh, led the Northern Alliance, and between 1996 and 2001, uh, that that period was one in which they tried to uh, basically eliminate uh, any adversaries, including Massoud and the, those in the Panjshir Valley. And uh, but you know, I think that what's interesting now is that the Taliban of that period of 20 years ago is not the same Taliban now. Uh, now the Taliban are are seen as legitimate statecraft actors. They have mm. seen themselves less in the parochialism of Afghanistan and more on, okay, well, how do we actually decide uh, to run this state? And they're, and they're besieged by a bigger problem, which is in the past 20 years, we have seen millions of Afghans return to the borders we have also seen millions of Afghans born in this period. One of the most epic, rapid growth of population the world has seen over the last 20 years has taken place in Afghanistan. So the, the Taliban are not only besieged with this problem of being state actors rather than a local Afghan uh, militia, they are also uh, governing a population that is far more cosmopolitan and has come of age in the age of modernity, where cell phones, smartphones, television, music, all of these things were not part of the 1990s Taliban that existed then. So, so what are, what, what's your assessment of the chances of that being actually carried out, that, that evolution, right? You know, and, and I think about how probably the average age of your typical Taliban member in 20 years ago, right, was probably somebody in their 20s and 30s. And now it's people, those same people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, right? And that just changes people on one hand. Um, on the flip side, have, have, they, have they actually evolved? What's, what's your assessment there? But I think like Hamid well, said, I mean, it's not the same group, right? It's not, right? I mean, these aren't the same people that were in their 20s or 30s 20 years ago. Yeah, it's really, it's, I think that's the mystery right now. I mm -hmm. think the mystery is, is figuring out who the Taliban are, because you have the older generation that uh, no longer is, uh, you know, many of the lieutenants of Mullah Omar are now in charge, the for current president, the, for the, the current uh, sort of spiritual leader, the Amir al-Mumineen, are all part of that original cast of characters uh, in the 90s. But at the same time, there are many on the subordinate level that were born in this era many of them. And the question really comes now to organization. Does Is there a top-down approach? Is there a bottom-up demand side that's going on that's going to change some of the attitudes? Uh, and it's really 
o- open to debate because right now there is a there is a very wide and very broad focal point on what's going on. There's a, and of course there's a great deal of international tension. So countries like the UK, the US, many in the West are particularly interested in what transpires. And of course China, India, uh, and many other countries are also deeply interested. What what will what is open to to see is to what extent are we going to still have that level of communication? Is Twitter, social media still going to be available? Are we going to get the on-the-ground reporting that we did? I think the signs are uh, very mixed. Uh, for example, the, tal- the current Taliban regime has announced that uh, music will not be allowed. So it's very reminiscent of what we saw before yeah. during the 1990s. We have also heard, and it's quite an interesting admission on the part of the Taliban right now, that they believe that women should not be out in force, not necessarily because of their earlier views espoused in the 1990s, but because they don't believe that their own Taliban are are particularly trained well enough to deal with women in the public space. So it, it's an interesting uh, point that we're at. And a lot of people, of course, are rightly nervous that the Taliban will go back to what they did before, that they will relegate uh, women to the home, but worse yet, the bigger challenge: How do you run a government? How do you run a society as broad and as far as? And, and how do you do it in the modern economy? Uh, right? We're talking about runs on the banks. We're talking about credit cards. We're talking about humanitarian aid. That the the number of problems is insane. Yeah, and and related to that, I mean, like I said, I, I didn't. You can definitely um, address this as well, but Trump made a deal with the Taliban, right? And and as and Biden it sounds like Biden basically said, "Hey, this deal's made. I'm not going to back out because I also want the U.S. out." Um, but to what degree? My question is: To what degree is the U.S. going to be an ongoing partner to the Taliban? Like there was a deal made, and they agreed, and they negotiated, and they got out. But is this going? Is there going to be like? The support, maybe funding or training or any negotiation, you know, you give us this, we'll give you that going on. Or is it going to be kind of a hands off, like you're an enemy, but, uh, you know, and we're not going to deal with you at all. What, what's the, what do you think? You know, I, I think that's a great question. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that it's inevitable that the United States um, will continue a relationship with the Taliban They've already established probably the first uh, inroads into that conversation when Ambassador Khalilzad uh, opened the door to the Taliban. And this is coming at various iterations of, during the Obama administration and continued during the Trump administration and has obviously continued during the current administration. Uh, and I was I was actually one of the people that uh, Khalilzad uh, turned to to try to help decipher where the Taliban were going, in part because... I understood a lot of the religious messaging that the Taliban were were, re- were relaying, and I will say that um, look, there are, there's still a perennial issue about, and, and it, it couldn't have been better it couldn't have been better highlighted by ISIS K's presence, uh, which is to what extent will terrorism still be an issue? To what extent will the lack of governance on the part of the Taliban presage? other terrorist groups from taking hold. And of course, it's very hard to imagine, it's very hard to imagine the Taliban in isolation when they share a border with Iran, when they obviously share uh, a significant border with Pakistan and obviously with India and China. So all of these countries in Central Asia have been dramatic have been dramatically affected by the Taliban. So I think even for the strategic interest of the United States, maybe not so much on the person-to-person interest, but who knows, uh, I think the United States would be frankly remiss not to. And and of course, the administration currently uh, continues to promise that they will be able to monitor the situation uh, in Afghanistan uh, from afar because they too understand that... uh, a reemergence of ISIS, ISIS-K, Al-Qaeda, or, or God knows which other actors uh, might reemerge in the vacuum that occurs with the Taliban taking over. You mentioned I mean, so many, so yeah, so many points. Def- Go ahead, Omar. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, it definitely makes sense 
to do that, right? From a strategic point of view, the question is, will the U.S. to what? How will the U.S. public? How can you pull it off politically, right? That's that's kind of a, another issue. Is like, can you even politically? Can Biden, for example, sell uh, partnering with the Taliban on certain things, right? But that's maybe a whole different topic. Yeah, I think that. Uh, listen, I. <laughs> I, I find it very interesting because the public discourse has largely revolved around the fact that, you know, especially with 20 years uh, having passed to 9-11, you know, we're now dealing with these folks uh, in a transactional way right now as we as we try to achieve the withdrawal as smoothly as possible. And, of course, that has been racked with great difficulty. Um, but the United States has been accustomed to dealing with bad actors and and, frankly, you know, as, as the often adage is very Nixonian, it doesn't mean that because the United States wants to talk to the Taliban that they ought not to, because there remains to be a several interests that, that coincide with the Taliban and the United States. Um, the, the appetite might change. And of course, if the, if the Taliban, you know, the, the Taliban, the new Taliban says, we don't want any, we want good relations with our neighbors. We want good relations with everybody you know, in some way, shape or form, but it's going to be very hard to imagine that there won't be an enormous amount of friction. Um, if for example, uh, we learn that the Taliban are, are going after people who would have cooperated with the United States, it's hard to imagine that the United States is going to, uh, look, uh, with any pleasure to the Taliban if they start to, uh, go through the process of recrimination and revenge in country, to those that supported the government or the United States at large. Exactly. Um, you know, no, I was just thinking, going back to your point about ISIS-K and, and, and these other groups that are, I mean, you know, if we, like what happened last week at, at the airport um, and ISIS-K claiming responsibility, I mean, I wonder, one, like what that, like how, how the Taliban sort of responded to that internally, right? I mean, we've already heard kind of the, um, you know, you know, typical kind of belligerency or like the rhetoric at least of, of, of going after and finding these people from the Biden administration. But I mean, how did the Taliban respond? Because, and, and one would hope that the Americans would have learned by now that, you know, in the absence or when you have a vacuum that is created, this is sort of ISIS's MO, right? This is where they come in and this is where they essentially do what they do, which is in the presence of a vacuum, they, they attempt to fill that vacuum. And what, yeah, that's really my concern is that if the Taliban aren't supported or, um, I mean, internally, you, you sort of just have chaos, which is far worse than at least having even a, you know, uh, a, a, you know, say ideologically driven um, government, uh, government, excuse me, in the uh, in the Taliban. Well, I would say this, and this is the warning sign that I think everybody needs mm -hmm. to to be aware of, which is ISIS represents ISIS K, ISIS, uh, you know, whether in Syria or the, or the night or the like, represents ideologically something even more dangerous than the Taliban. Right. Uh, the Taliban, in many respects, represents two important things. One, they represent they represent Afghanistan. They're largely Afghan. They're Pashtun, and many of their derivations of Islamic law, however harsh are, are um, uh, very traditional in mindset, and but very much consistent with the Pashtun Wali that many in Afghanistan have grown accustomed to. I uh, you know, however, sorry, oh, sorry, don't mean to cut you off. No, no, I don't mean to cut you off because I've been wanting to just draw a quick, you know, like make a distinction or, or allow some nuance there because I think earlier, you know, we talked about you know, the Dale Bundy kind of school that, that emerges in the subcontinent, India, Pakistan, as being the ideological forebearer to the Taliban. But I think, I mean, certainly one cannot deny that the Taliban then sort of, you know, uh, certainly are informed by that from a classical or ideological frame, but that's then colored and tempered by Pashtun, Pashtun and local tribal culture and approaches as well right i mean i, I think one one oh, cannot absolutely just, right yeah, yeah i just wanted you to they are yeah they i wanted are, our they leaders in, to know that we're making that distinction because i mean they, like yeah yeah they are inextricably linked there is no way to fully appreciate and this is i think a, a nuance that 
I think was missed by many of those who worked in country, which is they didn't appreciate the inextricable link between Pashtunwali and uh, the Taliban because issues of honor, issues of revenge, issues of hospitality, all of those things, the, 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 the notions that the Taliban were were mentioning in their messages to the United States in the, in the run-up to the, to, uh, uh, the 2001 invasion were in many ways consistent with their approach to both Islam, but what they also saw was there was no inconsistency between their cultural norms and Islam itself. So that, for example, if they talk about the role of women in many, in, in many, and in many, I guess, in the thought process of the Taliban, relegating women to the periphery uh, of society is consistent with their concept of honor, but it's also consistent with their understanding of Islam. Now, for many on the broader Islamic point of view, especially on the classical Islamic legal perspective, they see that as, uh, as something that cannot be meshed together. Uh, today, or at least a deputy spokesman mentioned that um, girls and boys will be separated in early education. That was the understanding that we got from uh, a deputy talib. There is not one other Muslim country in the world that seg- segregates men and uh, boys, little boys and little girls for purposes of education in any other Muslim country. And yet that seems to be the, the norm for the Afghans. So is that Islamic? I don't think so. Is that normative with their cultural ethos? Absolutely. Um, and that I think is something that has been lost. Now, mm-hmm. take that a step further. When we're talking about ISIS, we're talking about an ideological group that sees sees the Taliban as too lenient. We see, I mean, according to what they have said publicly, the Taliban are not harsh enough. They are not, for example, enforcing Hadood ordinances. They are not beating people to the point that needs to be done. Uh, So what ISIS is saying, at least right now, ISIS-K is saying is the Taliban are doing a disservice to Islam because they're not strict enough. Now, what's missing from the ISIS piece, and one of the reasons why I, I, I wonder about their longevity, is that they are not also acting as statecraft. The Taliban are in this unique position now where they have to put up or shut up. And if they don't, they they run the risk of being delegitimized. But Absolutely. you know, you notice there's no competing message on the part of ISIS K. There is no message on their part that's saying, hey, we're gonna build a better state. All they are saying is we're just gonna bring a more harsher form of law and order. And frankly, many in Afghanistan are a little tired of law and uh, law and order when they really want state services, when they want that social contract that I mentioned earlier, and they want that reciprocal relationship between governed and those on the governing. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. And, and, and what's sad, and I think what saddens me already is that, you know, I would hope that Americans or, 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 or those in the West would begin to see the kind of nuances that people like yourself and others have been sort of screaming from the rooftops in terms of, look, we need to draw distinctions between, yes, even a Taliban strict interpretus, uh, sorry, interpretation of Islam versus what ISIS brings or the Muslim Brotherhood and what ISIS brings, like if we talk about the Ikhwan in, 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 in Egypt. And, you know, I couldn't help but think of some of the parallels when you were talking about putting up, shutting up, et cetera, because, you know, what happens in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, 75 plus 80 years in the making in terms of finally coming to power and with, with, with Morsi, and you don't even last like a year Right. Right. Now. Right. So. So, yeah, I mean, that's a telltale sign or, or that's certainly a warning or um, and, and yeah, like I said, I, I wish that we would begin to see some nuance, um, but I, I'm not holding my breath. And uh, frankly, I, I think a lot of what you're describing and talking about also is very beautifully detailed and fleshed out. Uh, to the best you can in an op-ed piece in, in the USA, uh, to the, you know, like, yeah, in the op-ed piece that Omar referenced earlier, which we'll definitely link to in the episode. Um, but as we begin to kind of wrap and close out, um, Hamid, I, I, I want you to kind of talk about what we've seen in the last few weeks in particular. So, okay, we, we, we've gotten a, you know, a good enough analysis as to what brought us here, what deal 
had the Taliban made with the Trump administration, is, is Trump administration, et cetera. But where the where where the Biden administration failed as it when it when when as it comes to the execution of said withdrawal, right? And that's I think what we're beginning to see here in the United States with finger pointing going on on both sides as to you know how it was executed. So I mean I'd, I'd love for you to kind of talk about that, especially as someone who you know is involved with some of the work of getting the refugees of getting you know those who want to leave Afghanistan out. Well, I will say that this has been, you know, a parade of horribles. I mean, a perfect storm, if you will. Uh, here we are in the midst of of, uh, of Ida striking the United States, and I couldn't think of a more apt analogy. Everything has to come about, frankly, for this to be so horrible. Uh, first and foremost, I think a lot of the blame squarely, uh, squarely rests on the shoulders of the previous government in Afghanistan, and that of Ashraf Ghani. Um, who, frankly, really, I think, lost focus, decided mm-hmm. to be willfully ignorant and didn't see the writing on the wall. And I think that the Americans, to a large extent, uh, also were not paying as close of attention to the fact that the Taliban were making gains very quickly, but importantly, making gains without firing a shot. Uh, and I think that that was a very important, I think when we sort of predicted what would happen in a post-U.S. withdrawal, what we, what we predicted was looking at the past, imagining a civil war, but, at, but imagining that the current government would be robust enough to, with, to withstand um, the onslaught of the Taliban. But I think at the top, when we talked about some of the misgivings of the current government, what we found was a government that was inept that was uh, incredibly isolated, that had been depriving their armed forces of resources. And I think that the United States, in part, uh, didn't aid the situation when, for example, yes, it's true that Afghanistan technically had an air force. They didn't have, there wasn't an effective military to military uh, transition for, for example, ensuring proper air support. There wasn't the, the... the expeditious withdrawal of American forces from a variety of different places didn't come with any benchmarks. It didn't come with any, frankly, any conditions. When we spoke to the Taliban uh, and when I was uh, consulted on this, one, one of the glaring questions I had in the back of my mind is, wait a minute, what's our condition? The United States, yeah. for example, immediately excluded the Afghan government. So they weren't sitting at the table. And when we made our deal, then we forced uh, the two sides, the Taliban and the, and the current Afghan government or the previously departed government to sit together. And we already knew, I mean, I, I, anybody who knew Afghanistan knew that it was a losing hand. And yet the Afghan government seemed to be willfully blind to it. And we dug ourselves into a really bad situation where now we are racing against the clock to try to get American citizens, uh, green card holders, SIVs, parolees, various demographics out of the country as fast as possible before the 31st deadline. Um, so all in all, it, it was a perfect storm. I don't, I don't think we could have imagined the government in Kabul to fall so quickly. The Taliban didn't. We didn't. And yet we have a president who uh, departed the country without even telling his vice presidents he was doing so. And eliminating the leverage that that potential government could have had in having an orderly transition uh, to power. And frankly, let's be honest here. It goes back to something I mentioned earlier. The Taliban didn't just suddenly come about and exist on the playing field. They were always there. The the government in uh, Kabul just insisted that they didn't exist. And I have to tell you, my experience in Kabul... Uh, my experience in the country was there was always this sense that because they occupied this space, the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan was the be-all, end-all. They would insist to me, whether it was Supreme Court justices or government ministers, there is no other government besides us. And I and I, and I laughed. I mean, I, I honestly had a real problem with that insistence because I knew at a local level 
there were jirgas that were going to resolve disputes. I knew at a local level that the Taliban were often hitting, hidden and present in many places across the country. But they, in their mindset, insisted there's no authority but us. And mm-hmm. yet, look at how that authority quickly evaporated when one person decided to leave the country, when their acolytes left to places like Uzbekistan or to Iran or to India, many of whom just left the country and left the people, left the 34, you know, left the million, tens of millions of people uh, at the hands of the Taliban, who are, I think, frankly, a bit overwhelmed by the responsibility mm-hmm. that they're in right now. So I think that that culmin- and that combined with where the United States was makes for a perfect storm. Not before lining their pockets. You know, you were talking about people fleeing, you know, from the from, from the former government, right? I mean, they, they, they escape with, I think, uh, m- millions of dollars that are th- that they align their pockets with. So, I mean, there's a cynical part of me that wants to say, like, they saw the writing on the wall and they said, you know, each man for himself and, and sort of got out. With yeah. the withdrawal, it, I'm saying, you know what I mean? Like they, they, yeah. they, they, they sort of portended where the, where the withdrawal would lead to. Yeah. Yeah. So just as we get close to wrapping up, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the next, what are the next few days and weeks look like? And long-term, is there any room for optimism? What, what can we look to yeah. <laughs> and say, Hey, that there's, there's potential there. Well, to add a little bit of color to, I think, Omar's question, because I wanted to talk about these two things, and I think they, they kind of very nicely dovetail with Omar's general kind of question, um, you know, cl- closing out the episode, which is two things. One is, I, I really would like you to address the kind of refugee crisis and, and what happens mm-hmm. between now and the 31st, what, 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 what we can hopefully see in the months that follow. But but secondly, and maybe if you want to take this on first, I mean, we, we talked about a vacuum and what happens in a vacuum. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about two significant players in the Muslim world or certainly that region. Um, well, there's multiple. But if we look at Saudi Arabia, if we look at Iran and certainly the neighboring country of Pakistan, like how do you think that these perhaps three major players or three in particular, because and and, and, and let's say if we talk about Pakistan being a proxy to China, like, so, you know, in terms of Muslim uh, proxy, oh, how do you see these players react to what's happening in Afghanistan? Well, let's let's start with um, probably the most salient uh, country in all of this, and that is Pakistan. I mean, mm-hmm. there is little doubt that Pakistan has largely seen uh, a stable Afghanistan, and frankly, a, a stable. Afghanistan with, under the auspices of the Taliban in their, in their national self-interest um, because they do want to maintain focus on, on uh, India and many believe that many in the government, in the Islamic Republic's government, were beholden to India. So I think Pakistan stands to uh, gain in a strategic way. What remains for Pakistan, however, is what happens next. Do we see a refugee crisis like we did during the Soviet occupation? It's unlikely, but it remains to be seen. What I have heard from in the last 48 hours, in the last week or so, is that there is a massive group of people trying to leave into Pakistan. And I frankly think that the ISIS-K threat has only exacerbated that. So Mm -hmm. this is a real test for the Taliban to make sure that they can thwart their enemies in country if they have any hope of not having a a, a worsening brain drain that they've already suffered. And I think that will continue. Second, um, I think we saw sort of the writing on the wall, which is that China wants to do what they've done with a lot of regimes throughout the world, which is maintain good relations to their benefit. Uh, They share a small border with Afghanistan, but they also see that hidden behind everything else uh, is the enormous resource potential that Afghanistan presents. And I can bear witness to the fact that Afghanistan has enormous potential riches. Uh, The surveys that we had indicated uh, say that uh, Afghanistan could be the home of trillions of dollars in lithium, those wonderful things that power our phones, uh, but also minerals, resources, jewels, all the like. And I have no doubt 
that China wishes to reap from that benefit, especially being close to their border. As to the rest, whether it's Russia, China, or the like, I think the other big fear is it's very much situated with the United States, which is, is this going to be a hotbed for extremism? We are dealing with a, with a, with a Russia that is deeply concerned about Islamic extremism, but a China that is contending with its own Uyghur problem. Uh, and it seems like if there is any if there's any gravitational pull for all of these countries, it is going to be China's interest. And therefore, because it's China's interest, it's going to be the U.S.'s interest. Um, so from, a, from that macro perspective and then to the micro perspective, I think it, the writing is very much on the writing on the wall. I'm concerned about some of the min- minorities inside of, of uh, Afghanistan, particularly the Hazara population, which are Shia. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the concern that whether truthful or not, that they hold allegiances to Iran might might uh, uh, mean that they are, you know, under severe threat. Some may some have even spoken of a genocide. Um, and then, of course, the state the statecraft. I mean, are the are the Taliban going to be equipped to handle? Uh, the modern facets of a state? Are they going to be able to deal with uh, uh, modern financial needs when, for example, the World Bank has already cut off interest, when the current government or the current banks in the country uh, don't have access to foreign reserves, and when everyday Afghans don't have access to their pocketbooks? And then, of course, what's the other bigger part in all this? Without the assistance of U.S. or other Western forces, um, and Western NGOs, where are people going to get jobs? That's always been a perennial problem in Afghanistan. It's always been a perennial problem throughout uh, Afghanistan's rise, which is you have this massive population bulge, and that population is going to come of age in a very short period of time, and they're going to be looking for jobs. So in much the same way that you see in places like Egypt, uh, where you have a youthful bulge, or here in the United States, if you can't find meaningful occupation and meaningful uh, aspirations in life, where do people turn to? Right. What will they do? Yeah. So those are. Well, sort it's of all going to be. Those yeah. Yeah. Problems. I mean, it's going to be super interesting to see how this unfolds in the next in the next few months and weeks and and even years. Um, one thing I did want to a- ask you about just just lastly is we're we're I'm 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 uh, I'm having this call from uh, Newark. Which is very close to Fremont, California, which is uh, where also I am. known, <laughs> where is, which is where Provez is also known as Little Cobble. Uh, there's a little neighborhood uh, down, down, literally one exit down, and where they have several um, Afghani restaurants and markets and and whatnot. Uh, so there's a big Afghani population here, and I, I think um, one question I wanted to ask about. I've heard, I've already heard about some uh, some refugees coming, some yeah. families coming. Um, I want to ask you about what that looks like. I mean, will will the U.S. play its part in taking its its fair share? I mean, really, if you think about it, they, you know, we we probably should be the number one uh, to, country that takes in. But I don't know if that's the case. But what 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 role will the U.S. play there? Or well, should they? I, we we, we <laughs> owe it. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. We, we owe it. Yeah. I, I don't Thank see you. this as. I don't see this as a as a negotiable point. We made promises to the Afghans. I was guarded by many Afghans uh, in cooperation with the U.S. forces. I know of uh, members in the uniform, members who've served, veterans and the like, who've served in multiple wars that insist that the United States of America keep its word. And this is probably the most infuriating part in all of this. We made assurances and promises to many Afghans. Thousands upon thousands of Afghans. In fact, right now, I am in the midst of trying to get many of those promises fulfilled. And what's mm-hmm. the most frustrating to many here in the United States and to many in Afghanistan is this one big thing that we speak about in our foreign policy, but for which we are not living up to, which is keep our promises. We made a promise to these people. We made a promise that if they cooperate and they help us, that we will bring them to the United States. So I really don't know if it's a question of whether we feel like it. We owe it. 20 years Mm -hmm. of contributions requires that America fulfill and keep its word. And so if people feel that this is a matter of inconvenience or, uh, or, or some sort of temporary difficulty, 
I would only remind them that when the first American soldiers landed in Mazar Sharif, or when they were on ho- horseback and when they were trying to get their way to try to defeat the Taliban and situate themselves in a country that they did not know, or a place where they could not find targets, it was these Afghans, it was these people who put themselves on the line and banked on the credibility of the United States of America. That is the same credibility that brought people like my, my parents to this country. It is the same obligation we owe them. And it should not be a matter of convenience. This should not be a matter of convenience for the United States. We owe these people. We made promises. And it is incumbent upon us to fulfill that promise. Yeah. Well, let's let's hope and pray we do. I know the clock's ticking, but I think that's what we're all hoping that is the case. Yeah. Sort of breath abated. Uh, thank you for that um, sort of impassioned sort of reminder to our listeners. To I, I, I would hope to a broader audience as well of folks who are listening or who, or who do have your ear. Um, and 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 Godspeed to you for the work that you're doing and trying to get some of the people that cooperated and others out and 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 and, and to security. So thank you so much to me. Then of course. As we wrap and uh, conclude, thank you so much for taking the time away from family, away from commitments, and certainly away from the work you're doing to appear on our little podcast here. Um, and uh, it was a great conversation, one that I hope that we're able to revisit with you perhaps down the road uh, as there's more clarity and we begin to see how things flush out in the next few months. So we'd love to have you back on as a returning guest as well. Um, I guess what we uh, what I often like to ask our, our guests, what we often like to ask our guests is where can people engage you or, um, you know, if they wanted to reach out for questions or how how, the, how people can help and contribute, please plug any any means of doing that that, that, that you found reasonable. Well, I, I would first say that, first of all, I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to share whatever insights I have, however meager they might be. Um, mm. And and to sort of say that right now we're at, a, we're at an important turning point. Uh, many Americans are going to uh, perhaps see the images, but please don't feel like those images are far removed from what's going on. Many in the communities are going to require a great deal of support, and that support isn't just going to be translated in. Um, you know, the immediate period in which they get here, they're going to need support as communities and as people who immigrated to this country. But one final promise that I would urge everyone as as the son of immigrants um, and as someone who has uh, aspired to a career in public service and and frankly to increase an understanding about Islam as a professor and and, uh, as a public servant, don't underestimate the value that being an immigrant has in opening your eyes towards America. People like my parents, for example, work day in and day out for this concept and this idea of America. And as, as their son, I can personally assure you that uh, part of the reason why I'm so driven uh, in my everyday life, even though it doesn't always necessarily mean remunerative rewards, is that uh, Immigrants believe in the United States, and it doesn't matter whether the, that belief is hinged from where they are in Afghanistan. It doesn't matter whether their religion is Islam. That that eye-opening epiphany, as someone like myself who grew up in Wyoming, who saw their parents succeed bereft of education, only makes that adherence and faithfulness to the concept of what we call America that much stronger. Here we are. Here now we are seeing the first waves of Afghan immigrants who came because of that promise and who are intent upon fulfilling that promise. So let's not use this as an opportunity to scapegoat. Let's not use this opportunity to uh, reawaken Islamophobia or xenophobia. And let's just use this as an opportunity that many of those people on the front lines risk the concept of America in their own hearts, in their own places. They are now under threat and they come to this country with open eyes. So let's make sure to fulfill that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Hamid, again. And uh, it was a real pleasure, like I said, and we look forward to an opportunity to have you back on in the future. And uh, uh, to our listeners, uh, we... Yeah, no, thank you so much. Uh, to our listeners, uh, as always, uh, any thoughts, feedback, questions, um, you can send it our way, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, what have you. Uh, as always, thank you for listening, and we promise that uh, our next episode won't be as big of a hiatus as this one, but uh, we'll see you very soon on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Thanks always for listening.